Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Thanks for doing this, Franco. It's really great after all that's all this time <laughs> that we've known each other that you're finally on the podcast. <laughs> Yay! Yay! <laughs> and I know lots has been happening in your life. Uh, well, everybody's life in the last couple of years, but um, last year, I should say. Um, but I'm also really <laughs> curious about your story. And so our listeners want to hear your backstory and then we'll get into current day and what you're up to, if that's OK with you. So over to you. Yeah, perfect. Well, firstly, Michael, it's really wonderful to be able to do this um, and, and, and share my story. Uh, thank you ever so much for inviting me, because like many people, you know, everybody's favourite subject is themselves. So that's it. You've, give, you've given me you've given me uh, the king's throne to be able to do that. So uh, thank you. And, and of course, it's always, you know, it's always a pleasure to, um, to, to speak with you as well. So. Oh, gosh, my story started probably longer ago than I'd care to remember, um, 48 and a half years ago, in the Seychelles, of all places. Now, as people are probably wondering, that's not a Seychelles accent that's coming out of this world. <laughs> no! <laughs> but, um, yeah, so I was, I was born um, on the 5th of October, 1972, at about 4am, apparently, in Victoria Hospital in the Seychelles. Nice. Which you know, a lot of people are thinking, you know, well, what on earth are you doing here? Which is uh, which is a very good question. But yes. um, I, I lived in um, I lived in say on the main island, which is called Mahe, and we lived in a there's an area of the and the sort of north and north uh, west of the island called um, Glassy, and uh, we lived in a just it's just like a little hamlet really, but all the you know there's loads of like um, uh, little places sort of all joined together. And uh, and I can actually remember that it was uh, it was really wonderful and and even though it was a long time ago I can remember but um, I lived there until I was five and then my mum and I moved to the UK. <coughs> Excuse me, and this is the point where people say, well, you know, what on earth did you move for? Well, at the age of five, you don't really have much choice. You just got to do no. whatever you're told. That's um, right. <laughs> and of course, at the age of five, everything is an adventure as well, isn't it? So it yeah. was um, it was very exciting. So we, you know, if you're going to move to the UK, one of the nicest places you can move to is the Lake District. And that's exactly where we, we ended up. So nice. I, I then grew up from the age of five to 13 um, near in a, a place near Carlisle. As you come out of Carlisle, which is right next to the sort of England, Scotland border in North Cumbria. Um, in the UK, and you head down into the Lake District, some of the nice areas like Keswick and 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 Cockermouth and all the lovely lakes. So I was about sort of ten miles back down towards the lakes, and it was it was beautiful. I mean, I, I look back on that now and just think, you know, how fortunate to have been born in one of the most beautiful places on the planet, and then to have grown up in one of the be most beautiful places um, in the United Kingdom. Yeah, and thankfully. Thankfully, I, I, I really made the most of it as well um, when I was a kid. We were always, we were always going out and, and doing things. And I had some friends who were really close friends. We used to go on like camping trips and cycling trips. And we were part of the scout group. So we got to see loads and loads of um, uh, West Scotland as well, right up to the very top, to, the, to, to some of the aisles at the top, all the way down. And then, and then um, the Lake District itself. So it was brilliant, really, to be able to enjoy all that nature. And I think back to, you know, like when I was about sort of 12, maybe 13 years old, and and, and our parents used to just let us disappear for like, um, you know, weekends camping, especially in the holidays. I mean, I can't imagine, I can't imagine kids being able to do that. Um, no. But my friends and I would, you know, we'd make a packed lunch and disappear on our bikes for, for the whole day. And and this was back back in the days before mobile phones as well, and it was it was really wonderful being able to um, to make a lot of use of that. And um, it was interesting. Like back then, all I ever wanted to do was be an airline pilot, which I think was because where I'd grown up for the first five years in my life in the Seychelles was was over one of the flight paths um, yeah. coming down to Victoria International Airport. I remember just being really fascinated by these things. Um, 
And then as time went on, I, I, I still, right, I think right up until the age of about 14, I was like, that's all I'm going to do is fly planes. I wanted to be a British Airways airline pilot. That's all. I, nothing else mattered to me. And, um, and sort of couple that, couple that at the same time, by the time I was about sort of 13, I was like, yeah, I, I mean, I love this place as in, as in North Cumbria, but I, I really wanted to go and explore the world and the rest of the country. So I was sort of counting down the days till I turned 18 and I could leave home and go to university and stuff. But I got some really poor careers advice when I was about 14, maybe 15, which basically kind of shattered, long story short, kind of shattered my flying dream, really. Yeah. And I thought, Oh, and I, I guess I just didn't have the wherewithal at the time to think, you know, screw that. I'm just going to go and do it anyway. You know, you think like adults have got all the answers and, oh, well, they must be right. So I was like, oh, what am I going to do with my life now? <laughs> so um, I went to college um, for a couple of years when I when I um, left school. I had various sort of part-time jobs and then went to university and studied building surveying um, at Northumbria University in Newcastle-upon-Time, which is only about an hour away from, from Carlisle. Yeah. And um, I'd actually, actually, I'd worked as a mechanic for, I think it was almost a couple of years beforehand, so I was a sort of couple of years late going to university. And, um, and university was great fun. I mean, I did building surveying, but really all I wanted to do was have fun. And I did have a lot of fun, but <laughs> somehow... Somehow I sort of dragged myself over the finish line and, um, and and came away with what we used to call back then a Bishop Desmond tutu because I got a two two um, <laughs> <laughs> in, uh, in 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 building surveying and um, promptly decided that the best thing to do with that was to go and sell IT. Uh, of course, yeah, <laughs> as you do. Um, yeah. I mean, because I'd I'd applied for a lot of surveying jobs. Uh, graduate surveying jobs, but I'd done my degree full time, and a lot of the other degrees were were actually um, had a placement year. And in that placement year, um, you did what part of your professional diary in that year. So when it came to actually applying for jobs, the majority of people who were applying had that placement year experience, and I didn't have that. And I think after about I don't know, probably about forty or fifty applications, and not getting anywhere. And I guess because my heart wasn't in it either, no. I just thought. What am I going to do? And I thought, I know, get rich. That's exactly what I'm going to do. Yes. So, <laughs> so, uh, so, so I um, um, just through a series of sort of um, things that things that happened, I ended up moving to London and uh, worked for the property department. Funnily enough, I actually did do a little bit with my degree. Um, I worked in the property department for Paddington Rail Station for about a month or so. It was only a temporary yeah. contract, which was, it was actually quite interesting. Uh, and then I got my first graduate uh, job as a trainee salesperson for a tech startup, which was a real baptism of fire, I'll tell you. I bet. Um, I mean, our, our sales director at the time, he, he also was um, a, a, a part owner of the company and we used to sort of only semi-jokingly say that what he did for fun at the weekends was um, was was going dictate in a third third world country somewhere because it really was a sort of intense boiler room kind of environment and uh, yeah you know you were always sort of like covering for uh, uh, ducking for cover whenever he was around because uh, yeah he was uh, quite a volatile guy but it was a brilliant training ground at the same time Michael um, yes. you know taught me a lot about. What's important about selling taught me a lot about what's not important about selling, but it also taught me a lot about what not to do and how not to do it as well. Mm, mm. So I then progressed um, into various sort of tech companies, um, data storage companies, um, global internet service providers, business to business. Um, yeah. And then I eventually ended up, because um, I'm, I guess, because I've always struggled with authority, really. I, mm -hmm. and, and I was just like, you know, screw this. I can do a better job working for myself. And serendipity, I was going to move to Australia um, and I was just about to go. And uh, a good friend of mine who's, who's a bit older than me, but he's a really, 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 still is a really good Windows engineer. And um, we went for lunch one day because I'd actually met him at that original company. And he said, look, I've had a great idea. He said, he said you don't want anything from going to Australia because he'd actually lived there himself for a while. He said, it's, it's really overrated. <laughs> are you sure about, are you sure about that? Oh. Really? 
<laughs> but I thought, oh. but at the same, but at the same time, I was having a bit of an early midlife crisis. I was almost thirty. I was, yeah. was, in fact, it was actually pretty much exactly the time of my thirtieth birthday. So I was having an early life crisis. Yeah. And I thought, you know, what the hell am I going to do with myself? And blah blah blah. And this opportunity came up, and I thought, great, I can get really rich doing this. So. <laughs> Yeah. I know, crazy, crazy. It made sense at the time. So anyway, so we moved to the, to, we left London and um, moved to the West Country to Cheltenham, which was where my um, friend is from. And we ran the business um, for however long it was and, you know, ups and downs and my goodness, what a baptism of fire again that was. Um, what was that business doing? So we we were an, we were a, a technology infrastructure provider. So what we'd do is we'd we'd come from a corporate background of working for providing tech infrastructure and data solutions for big organisations. And the idea was, well, what if we could take that super professional high level of service and professionalism um, and apply that to a much smaller market? Because we'd seen that, you know, it was it was really. For, for a lot of smaller businesses, so I'm talking sort of, you know, five people on an IT network up to about 50, um, yeah. they tended to work with more local people and they got a more local kind of service and the quality of that service wasn't really that good. And we found a real lovely sweet spot where an organization that had got to a particular size couldn't quite justify paying 40, 50 grand a year to an IT manager, but at the same time couldn't do it themselves anymore. Um and so because of the lack of organization and management, their IT infrastructure was kind of stalling, which was having a massive impact on the productivity of the business. So we found this really lovely sweet spot. So that's what we did. Right. Um, but anyway, long story short, um, that, that didn't work out in the end. So I resigned from the business. We parted amicably and um, I resigned from the business after a while and then had another meltdown and decided, oh, you know, what on earth I'm going to do. Went traveling with my then wife for a while just to try and work out what on earth I was going to do. Got mugged in Buenos Aires when I was traveling, which was one of the best things that ever happened to me, believe oh, it or not. No. Because that actually then led me down the path of personal development. Right. Um, it's interesting because what had happened was we, we'd had a lovely time for a few months traveling around um, Brazil and Argentina. We had planned to go to Peru, but we didn't make it for various reasons. So it was the last week of our trip, and we thought, right, we're going to go to Buenos Aires and just party for, for the whole week. I think it was a week and a half or a week, whatever it was. We got mugged as soon as we got there, and they took all the money that we had for partying. We were like, oh, right, so it's actually going to be the opposite. <laughs> and it was oh, interesting. Well. Yeah, yeah, it's tap water, unfortunately, instead of tequila. But um, we... As serendipity would have it, we were in this, we'd already booked this lovely hostel. And in this hostel was in the top, on the top floor, where we're not going to be going out um, drinking and having fun every day for the next week. So what can we do? I know, read books. There's a library upstairs. Oh. And I'm such a big believer in, in you brought the things that you need to see when you need to see them. As long, mm. And if, you know, as long as you pay attention to them, you'll see them. And, I was up in this library, I think it was like the day after we'd booked in, and I just thought, oh, well, I might as well pick a book to read. And this one particular book really stood out to me it was Dean Graziosi's Totally Fulfilled. I thought, oh, that sounds interesting. And it was a personal development book. And I tell you what, it just blew my mind. I'd never been into personal development before. If anything, I was actually really snippy about it and thought it was ridiculous. I thought, you know, if you can't do it yourself, what on earth do you need other people to tell you what, how to do it for? Yes. That's crazy. And honestly, Michael, I read this book and it just punched me in the face like, like, like an elephant had sat on me. Honestly, wow. it, was, it was incredible. And, and a part of it was um, he'd made a lot of his fortune, earlier fortune, through property development. And because I'd my my um, now ex-wife but at the time we were still together we um we, we'd done up a couple of properties and that's how we were looking to create some additional income and all those things had come together so as soon as we got back to the uk we promptly got divorced <laughs> and uh and and then i um started a property trading business with another pal of my well, a, a, a chap i became friends with for a while yeah, um, but we did we did that just as the crash of two thousand and eight two thousand and nine happened, which was terrible timing. The right business, but at the wrong time, unfortunately. And I think because we were new, we, we just 
in the end, after about a year or so, we just thought, ah, this um, we can't seem to make this work. So no. Um, then I had another massive meltdown, and yeah. um, and, and it's interesting again. It's it's funny, like you know, when again when you're ready for these things, the answers just appear. And I ended up having a huge epiphany um, when I stopped feeling sorry myself, and I realised that actually. One of the things that I'd always done in my life was help people to um, solve problems. And people always used to come from me adv- for, to me for advice. And I just thought, why on earth don't I get paid for this? Because I love it. It's really good fun. And I'd actually heard that voice when I'd left the uh, technology business that I had about seven years previously, but um, about four years previously, sorry, but just had never really paid any attention to it. And I ended yeah. up working in I ended up working in commercial construction for a while after that. But but the wheels were turning to um, set the property business, uh, set the coaching business up, and uh, that's where I am today, working with um, business uh, business owners and entrepreneurs and senior leaders in larger corporate corporations um, to get things done. So that's that's me. <laughs> that's you. Okay. Goodbye. See ya. <laughs> <laughs> like twenty minute quick summary of everything yeah. that's been going on. Okay, so what I, I I've got some questions now that sure. have come up in my head. I wanted you to get through all of that to so thank you very much. It's fascinating. And what's so fascinating is how you had these gifts which weren't gifts at the time, but they became gifts, you know. Uh, yeah. when you have all these challenges and that that's fascinating I f- I'm a big believer in that so so Dean I've what's his surname again Graz, Gra- Dean Graziosi G-R-A-Z-I-O-S-I I think it is yeah I have come across him I think a couple of years ago or maybe even less he did a he's done some sort of e-learning program with Tony Robbins um which they were highly promoting and um i didn't sign up for it in the end Mm. but um but when you discovered him what what changed in you and i know you said it had a big massive punch in your face but yeah what 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 shifted because you know we're, we're all conditioned at a very young age and then when something like that comes along, do we actually change or, you know, does it have an effect on us in terms of our outlook or the way that we think or observe things? Are, 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 you know, do we view things differently? I'm really interested to know what happened. That is such a wonderful question, Michael, because there are so many different ways we can unpack that. And I won't take another 20 minutes explaining it, but. No, it's fine. It was basically what had happened was I, I since the moment. So, so if you rewind back to fourteen-year-old me when I'd had that a series of awful careers advice, and suddenly my dream, I felt like my dream had been taken away from me. Yeah. From that moment forward, the whole of my life, and particularly my pre- professional life, had been nothing but frustration, looking for the right answers constantly changing jobs, trying to, when I couldn't find true fulfillment, I thought, right, I know, I'm just going to make loads and loads and loads of money. Um, Mm. That's the next best option. And I did that to varying degrees of success and failure. Um, But the thing was, and excuse me, and the thing was, I'll have to admit that when my then wife and I went traveling, we were pretty much on our last legs as a, as a, as a, excuse me, as a relationship. Yeah. (coughs) Excuse me. And I think because I had such a huge sense of frustration and almost despair sometimes and knew in my bones that I really, really, really had to do things differently because I wasn't going, I wasn't prepared to spend the rest of my life feeling frustrated and lost and not knowing what I was going to do. That's the first element. And I think that, yeah. I think that as humans, when we project whatever you, everybody's heard the expression, you attract what you project. And I think because I was projecting, I want an answer on a subconscious level. I was looking for answers. Yeah. And the universe kind of brought those answers to me in a roundabout way by again, getting mugged 
um, which could have ended very, very badly for both of yeah. us. But th thankfully, neither of us were hurt. Um, we had stuff stolen, but neither of us were hurt, thankfully. Yeah, yeah. So that's the first element of it. But then I think the second element of it, um, Michael, is that when I look back on my life, right back from the start, and, you know, I had confirmation of this very recently. I accidentally bumped into a girl who I haven't seen for about 25, maybe 28 years, who I actually used to go to school with. Right. And right, com long story short, completely randomly, she's the wife of somebody I was, <clears throat> I was helping with, um, with, 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 with a project. Purely coincidentally, she happened to stumble into the video call. We got talking. We didn't recognize each other at first, but we got talking. And then she went, oh, my God. Franco, and she said to me, she said, you know, the thing is, I'm not surprised that you are a state of mind coach helping people in business, because when you were at school, everybody came to you who had problems. You were the guy that could keep a secret and you were the guy that seemed to be able to just cheer people up without even really trying. And I was like, really? She was like, oh, wow. yeah, God. She said you were renowned for it. And it didn't feel like that to me at the time. And no. firstly, absolutely melted my heart because I just thought, oh, what a beautiful thing for her to share and, and yeah. for me to hear. Yeah. But the, re the reason that I bring that up, Michael, is that, is that it then, it's then it's, it's since become clear to me that what I'm doing now, in other words, to help people to be better and feel better and solve massive problems and be at the best every day through understanding how the human experience works, that's fundamentally what I've been doing all my life because I've got a very close relationship with my brother and sister. And so when I opened that book, I think it spoke to those two things. It spoke to the frustration that I'd been feeling for all that time. But I think it also spoke to inherently who I am. And, 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 and again, the universe just seems to have conspired to bring those things together at the moment when I was ready to receive them. Right. Okay. I, that, that's fascinating in terms of you know, it was speaking to something that already existed inside of you. Yeah. And therefore you recognized it. Um, you know, brilliant. Okay. I, so, I didn't, to be fair, I didn't at the time consciously. No. no. It was just that it, as soon as I got about the, into the first chapter, I just knew instinctively straight away. Uh, you know, it's like when you meet someone, like when you meet a, a partner especially some people they can be very attractive but they're just not quite there and other people or, or even just in friendships you're like yeah it's, it's a feeling as opposed to an intellectual yeah thought. Yeah. yeah brilliant okay so then you went on a few other journeys and then you discovered that you know you perhaps with all of this helping of people perhaps i should get rewarded for doing that right yeah that's a great instinct and thought process to have and discovery but it's not as easy then to make that a reality and mm. go right i've got this great idea you know i've i've put aside those get rich quick schemes that are ideas i had in the past but i just want to earn a decent wage or living from helping other people because it's something I've been doing anyway. So that is great. But then with that, where did you go and how did it get started? Sure. So, <clears throat> so the, the, the backstory to, to making that decision was that when I started my um, property trading business with the other chap, um, as soon as we got back from traveling, uh, I enrolled on a 12-month um, uh, property training program with one of the guy's biggest property development trainers um, based in the Midlands. And a big part of that program was, in fact, I would say about 70% of it was actual personal development and 30% of it was property training because he realized that for people to be successful, they had to sort their mindset out. So that spoke to me. So ha having, having read Dean's book, um, in, in, or whenever it was uh, in sort of mid 2008 when, when we got mugged. And then a few months later, I start this program, um, you know, following, following the breadcrumbs of what the universe had delivered. And the 12 months of that was mostly personal development. So in the meantime, I'd listened to The Secret a million times. I'd read loads of personal development books and so on and so on. Yeah. And, and, and so 
I didn't start doing it immediately because I had to work out, you know, I had to work through loads of problems like, well, hang on a minute, I'm not good enough. Who's going to believe me? Blah, 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 blah. All the That's things right. that all the things that had stopped me doing it four years ago when I'd heard it, only this time I thought I need to pay attention to that. So I just did what seemed logical. Well, first of all, um, I need to go and find out how to build a coaching business. So and I need to um, discover what other it's all well and good people giving people advice, but I thought to be a coach, then surely you must need some more formal training to do that. So, so I then just went and in again, just followed the breadcrumbs of um, tried loads and loads of different kinds of trainings, most of which I didn't like, most of which a lot of which felt icky. But the ones that I did like and did feel right, I took the bits that I liked from them and I yeah. discarded everything else that, that I didn't like or didn't work for me. And it was just, you know, I'd take two steps forwards, eight steps back, nine steps forward, two steps back, and mm -hmm. so on and so on and so on and so on, until eventually I got to my first paying client a couple of years later. Right, right, right. Got it. So, it, well, were you able to, to do something else whilst you were building up your coaching business? Yes, I did. So I decided... Um, Having, having always been fascinated by taking things to pieces, um, so I, was a, I was a mechanic for not quite a couple of years before I went to university. And when I was younger, I was like, I rebuilt a car in my car engine in my, of my first car in my mum's shed when I was 18 using a Haynes manual. Whoa. Uh, yeah. And it started <laughs> when I put it back together, believe it or not. That's ridiculous. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Why did so you I'm, miss that out? <laughs> That's yeah, amazing. So, <laughs> I just have always been fascinated by how things how things work, and um, and and so I thought, well, okay. So I had been in the IT industry um, yes. bef before that, but um, I've got a I've, I've got a really bad problem with high screen and computer screens, um, which had got to the point where it was so painful it was giving me migraines. So I couldn't go down that route and support myself um, um, with uh, an IT career anymore. So I thought, well, okay, what's the next best thing? Now, one of my um, longest and best friends from North Cumbria, who I grew up with, he's been an electrician since we left school. He said, why don't you get on the tools? Um, um, and, um, you know, so go, go and build some big buildings. And I'm like, that's a great idea. So I just phoned loads of people up and said, blagged it a little bit, bought some tools, blagged it and said, uh, and said, uh, "Do you need some help?" And eventually, again, after loads and loads of trying, and then I got my first my first few wins, got some work, and then just built it up that way. So I was I was working full time for um, in commercial construction for for quite a while um, before um, before that. But I was coaching part time as well. Right. Okay. It's a, it's a really interesting point because you know lots of people i mean some people that are listening to this podcast are thinking about starting their own business and you yeah. know how do you get started do you just kind of leave what you're doing in terms of employment and you know start on your own and just you know hope it's going to just happen overnight that's what i did by the way it didn't work me too uh, <laughs> <laughs> or or do you you know do something alongside it and build it up gradually um with the spare hours that you've got at uh, weekends and evenings and you know work work on it that way i mean there are two different schools of thought but you know we all need to feed ourselves and have a roof over our head so it's important to yeah. you know to keep something else going that's what i think i was curious about okay so that's great so um what happened when you got your first client for coaching I was terrified. <laughs> I was absolutely terrified. My actual, my actual first, my actual first paid uh, coaching was um, was I lectured uh, to some business studies students for a whole day. Um, I came in as a guest lecturer. I had, I had two groups, and um, and it was you know it was great fun and I, and I got that just through door knocking uh, and loads and loads of phone calls this is what i do would this be interesting because it just seemed to make sense um because i thought back to when i'd started in business and i thought nobody told me about state of mind in business and how vital it is in fact it's i think it's more important than skills training um i mean skills yes. training is very important but i think the state of mind understanding for the skills training to go on top of is is even more important as a, as a firm base to amplify the power of those skills 
And I thought, nobody taught me that before I'd even started work. And then I thought, oh, hang on a minute. Why don't I see, why don't I see if I can, it's a nice, easy way to speak to people. So I went and did this, uh, I went and did this uh, guest lecture for the day. And, and halfway through the first one, my, my jaw froze because I was so nervous. Yeah. Um, which was so embarrassing, so embarrassing. In fact, I very nearly, after the first session, just ran out of the university and didn't come back for the second session. I was so embarrassed. But I, I just knew that, I just knew that, well, that's ridiculous. You know, you, you've made a commitment, just keep going. So, so I did. Um, oh, good. But I was absolutely terrified um, um, the first time. And then when I got my first one-to-one -one client, um, less so, but still, it was pretty nerve-wracking. Because, mm -hmm. you know, all the old fears come back. Oh, hang on a minute. Who are you? You're not good enough. Why is anyone going to pay you? Well, they already have paid you. Now you just need to deliver it. But as with all those yeah. things, it's, um, I can't remember the lady who wrote the book. I don't actually think the book's that good, but I think the title is wonderful, which is Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Which, yeah, it's, it's a, well, the thing is the fear <laughs> isn't real anyway. Yeah. You know, it's, we make those fears up in our brain, in our mind. It's, it's just ridiculous. Um, and it's never true either. It's never, yeah. never true. So, okay, so you got your first client. How did you feel at the end of it? You got paid. I felt that Jesus Christ had nothing on me because I was walking <laughs> on water. He might, have, he might have had longer hair, but I tell you yeah. what, I was like, JC, you're one of my pupils, not the other way around. Not that I'm particular, <laughs> not that I'm religious or anything, but it was it was just unbelievable, Michael, because I realized that finally, finally, I'd found my well, I knew it, but I suppose it was it was real validation that I was on the right path, that this was my calling in life, because I just lost all sense of any kind of ego. We just were talking about fear. I look mm. back on I look back on how frightened I'd been prior to um, um, firing up the video call for the first conversation with the client. And I look back on that and, and exactly as you've just shared, I realized, what the hell was I so frightened about? It's like, it, it's like you need to share this stuff in the world because people need your help. And the guy, yeah. um, the, the, the guy who I'd worked with by the end of it, I mean, it was just, it was just incredible, but it was exactly that, Michael. I just fell um superhuman but not not in an ego driven way like i used to be in my corporate sales days which was very mm. ego driven but mm. just from a pure i think everybody's experienced being in the flow you know when you do something and it just it just happens through you but it's not you on a conscious level um yeah. sports teams often say that people in sports where you know, especially when a smaller team beats a much bigger, much better team. And like, I don't, we don't really know how we did it. We just sort of gelled together. And that's yeah. exactly what it was like for me. I just felt a combination of such deep humility, so much gratitude, so much love for the chap I just worked with, and so much love and gratitude that through all the awful challenges that I've been through and the ups, huge ups and the huge downs, it led me to that point where I realized that. I'd made such a difference in somebody's life and I got paid for it as well, which was, it, it was just incredible. Uh, I mean, it's almost, words almost can't do it justice. It's the, no, the feeling, no. feeling was incredible. And, that, and having that feeling would have, you know, propelled you forward to say, yes, I can continue with this. This is the right mm. thing to be doing, yeah. uh, which, is, which is fantastic. So, okay. You, something you mentioned, I have to admit, in all the years that I've been doing personal development for myself, I haven't heard these three words that you mentioned, which is state of mind. Mm. So share a little bit about that, because that's a really interesting thought and particularly interesting because I've been listening to some other teachings and they do talk a lot about the mind, but they don't say state of mind. And I haven't come across it before. Right. So if we, re if we rewind back to um, when I was doing all the personal development work as part of mm. the um, um, property training intensive I was a part of, 
what I found was, was that as I was reading all these personal development books, they were very helpful, like Dean's book and all the other ones that, I, that, that I'd read. They were very helpful, but I still inside felt this sense of pushing, like there was always something to do. There was always like, take action, take action. And as soon as you stop pushing, you'd lose the momentum and like, oh, I've got to start again. Yes. Keep pushing, keep pushing. Yes. And it, don't get me wrong. It was very, very helpful. But it, I knew that there was still a missing piece and a, a missing link. And I just didn't know what that was. Mm. And again, we've talked about serendipity. When you keep searching and you're in the right place to receive something, it's, it's brought to you. Mm. And... Um, I'd gone on a holiday in, in May of 2012, excuse me, to Mallorca, and I'd signed up for um, somebody. One of my friends had said, oh, like, you should try an LP. That'd be right down your street. So I'd looked at it and I thought, yeah, yeah I still wasn't very sure. And what the, a guy who was one of the UK's biggest um, NLP trainers at the time, I signed up for his newsletter. And, you know, the thing was, I, I'd signed up for about, I'd been on there for about nine months and never once read any of his newsletters. For some reason, I took my laptop with me on the holiday. God knows why, but I just took my laptop with me. Yeah. And with this chap, another one of his newsletters had come through, and I was just about to delete it, and I just heard this. wasn't even a voice. It was a feeling, I guess, with a voice, and he just said, open that email. And it was so strong. Open that email. like some, Almost like somebody had said it, and I thought, but hang on a minute. It's, it, I, I don't like – I don't – not really – Open the damn email. So I opened the email and it floored me because the guy had written, it was a sales email for um, a, a weekend event he was doing, but it was the way that he'd written it was geared up all around state of mind and, and how we experience everything through the quality of our state of mind. And that's what kind of led me on the path to use that as the, not just the fundamental understanding of what I share professionally, but also just how I live my life in general. And, and it's this, Michael, it's that we're all experiencing our thinking moment to moment to moment to moment. But because the thinking process is invisible and instantaneous, it looks like the outside world is creating our circumstances. So it's the economy that's making me mad. It's the competition that's making me mad. It's this um, business team I've got to work with. They're useless. They're holding me up. They're making me mad. That's not to say that there aren't things going on in the outside world. There are things that we yeah. need to, to, to navigate and deal with. Yeah. But my experience of those things is coming from the state, the quality of my state of mind, moment to moment, moment, moment to moment. So in this state of mind, I see the world this state, this way. But in this state of mind, I see the world that way. In that state of mind back there, don't even come near me because <laughs> you don't even want to hear what's going to come out of my mouth. And I realized because everybody knows this is true. So for the people who are listening, I, I always describe the holiday effect. Just before you go on holiday, you've got loads of things to do. You feel ever more stressed out and, there's, and, and uptight. And there's always that one person who's really annoying you and they're getting even more annoying. But somehow you manage to get everything done, get everything covered, passport in one hand, cocktail in the other, running down to the airport. Maybe not in the last year, but you know what I mean. And... Uh, <laughs> You go in your holiday, it takes you a day or two to really sort of chill out. You enjoy your holiday, a week, two weeks, whatever. Now you come back to your work situation or your business and you look at the situation just before you'd left and you go, do that, do that, do that, do that. Put those two people together, do that, do that, job done. And even the person who was annoying the hell out of you, you think, oh, I suppose they're not that bad, really. <laughs> now here's the thing, the situation itself hasn't really changed that much if at all but what has changed is how you see that situation and that's where state of mind comes in because it, it absolutely determines the quality of our state of mind determines our perception so people might be thinking so what well the so what is that it absolutely has a massive impact on our productivity and results in business and hand in hand with that the quality of our, our experience and how good we feel and how much stress we experience and allows us to bring back the joy to doing business, to life, and to really be at our best every day. It's like the hidden factor that nobody ever talks about. Mm. Brilliant. That's so beautifully explained and Thanks. really simple to understand, but so much harder to do. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. Why is it so hard to do? 
Another great question, Michael. It's because, I think, fundamentally because of two things. Firstly, because the thought process is not only instantaneous, but it's invisible as well. So we can't see the thought process going on. Um, it's no. because it's all, it's all in, in here. And also the fact that we live in a world where we are conditioned from such an early age to believe that everybody else and everything is responsible for how we feel. We get it mm. from our parents, we get it from colleagues, we get it from uh, the news, we get it from media, it's in our films, it's in our books. It's endemic that the yeah. whole world thinks that circumstances create our reality. So you couple those two things together, the fact that the thought process is invisible and that the whole world is trying to make you believe that somebody else is to blame or something else is to blame for how you feel. So it's, it's then no wonder um, that, that, that people think that. But the problem is, is that there's, there's no freedom in there. There's nothing, yeah. but, there's nothing but unhappiness, um, a lot of personal stress, a lot of personal um, discomfort and upset and a massive amount of lost productivity and enjoyment and lost money in business as well. Yeah. Yeah. Suffering. So yeah. Personal suffering. Yeah. Yeah. hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. And, um, what, I mean, obviously you help people <laughs> with strategies or, you know, give them some ideas which they have themselves, the tools, the resources they have themselves, but help yeah. them see, you know, the tools and resources that they have inside of them to be able to yeah. reverse it or change it. But is it lasting? Yes. It, when people understand it, yes. There, there, there are two elements to, to it, um, Michael. They, they're known as principles, and the word for me, principles means that it's true whether or not I think it is. So in other words, a, a one that's often used in, in, in our environment is, um, is sharing the um, example of gravity. So if Elon Musk and I are stood at the top of a very, very high building, the fact that he's the richest man in the world, or even if I was a homeless guy stood next to him, if we both decide to walk off the side of the building to get to the ground faster, we'll definitely get to the ground faster but the fact that he's one of the richest men in the world and I'm and 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 the net person next to him um, is a homeless person is irrelevant because the principle mm. of gravity is true for everybody all the time. And so naturally we work with that because we know that we know that if we do that, then it's not going to end very well. And mm. these principles behind how the human experience work really are that. And when people see it, um, it really it really changes how they see the world because they see the truth of the human experience and the fact that they are principles. Now, again, as we've already mentioned, because of the super fast-paced world we live in and, and the current um, um, sort of socioeconomic climate of fear, um, yes. fear and worry at the moment, it's very easy to revert back into, into the old zeitgeist of thinking that it's the circumstances that create our, our experience. So I would say... Mm. One thing I would say to that, and something I say in client work and in my own life as well, is, is it's important to stay in the conversation. And what I mean by that is to read, study, and watch stuff based on the state of mind, understanding, read books or listen to audiobooks or whatever. Um, join groups just to constantly remind yourself. Because one of the things that I love about this is that in business especially, the greatest untapped resource that any business has, whether you work for a business or whether you own the business, is the innate wisdom and health of its people to access the, the insights that they need at any time and no matter how busy they are to get done what they need to get done. And as um, the chap who uncovered this in recent times, Sydney Banks always said, you're only ever one thought away from a better feeling. And, and the truth of that is so powerful. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Thank you for explaining that. <laughs> and sorry for all the questions I'm firing at you. You had I'm, no I'm, time to prepare for this. <laughs> thank you. It, 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 keep, it keeps me sharp. I love it. But hopefully that, that, that answered the question. Yeah, I think, you know, whilst we're talking about it, for anybody that's listening, including me, it's still only philosophy, isn't it? Yeah. 
and yeah. until you experience it and there are there are, there has been in the last month a shift for me where i am noticing my conditioned response to things mm. much more there have even been at times where i've not been whole be able to hold back the conditioned response it has happened but i've noticed it happening right so I went, that's an interesting response. I just did. <laughs> and I might even continue some of it, you know, mm -hmm. but I'm kind of looking at myself, got to, well, you know, not in the mirror physically, but to my mind and going, wow, that's really interesting, Michael. So you you still want to continue with this as well. That's, <laughs> you know, it's like, so I'm like I'm standing outside of my own body, looking at my own actions going, you're weird, man. <laughs> uh, why do you want to keep doing that to yourself? You know. Um, so I, 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 you know, it. People have to start experiencing it. You can intellectually take it on board and go. Well, this makes a huge amount of sense. You know. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put that into action. But what I've noticed, uh in in doing this it's it's actually really at some level it's painful as well you know mm. it's it's kind of painful to see yourself doing that you and at the same time as well i'm having more compassion for myself yeah i'm kind of going rather than saying oh you're a weird guy saying you know i have compassion for you michael that you're going to that place and you and you're holding on to it um so yeah it's 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 yeah it just gets me you know listening to you it just gets me thinking about that struggle that suffering that we're all in but we have the power to do something about it yeah and i think that's what you're saying you your state of mind will dictate dictate where you go next type of thing in your mind um yeah wonderful mm -hmm. I, 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 there isn't the question there i'm just kind of reflecting on some of the things that you've said and I'm sure. putting, it, putting it into my own experience as well so um where how do people get hold of you or get in touch with you if they need some help with their state of mind in business and, and um, sure, sure. And, and what are the kind of people that you're <coughs> focusing on, on, on helping as well? Yeah, sure. So I, thanks, Michael. I work with, um, I work with um, business owners, particularly business owners who look after teams of people um, yeah. as well. Um, and I work with senior executives as well, also leaders of teams and, and, and departments as well. Um, not necessarily in any particular industry. I mean, at the moment, I am working with um, financial services and, and tech leaders um, right. quite a lot, which is interesting. Um, yeah. But again, the human experience is, 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 is the human experience. And a lot of people, you know, if they are thinking about this in business, the, the so what question comes up straight away. Well, state of mind is great, but so what? Well, the so what part of it is is um, you can solve sticky problems that have been holding back business growth in much less time, with a lot less effort, with far less mental effort, with a load less resources, and in a way that has you and your team be at your best every day. It massively transforms relationships, communication, um, resilience, confidence, and ultimately, it's a win-win situation. People feel better. People communicate much better. People are far more relaxed. And kind of against the um, regular truth is they actually do better in business, much, much better when they're in a calm and clear state. You become the sort of eye of the hurricane, if you like. So it's, it's a massive bottom line improvement and it's a personal bottom line improvement as well. So if people would like to um, explore that a bit more, I do. they can either find me, follow me on Instagram. It tends to be more sort of just purely state of mind, my Instagram stuff, which is at Franco, F-R-A-N-C-O uh, -A dot D-E-M for mother, O-R-I. Um, or you can email me at franco at demorivida, D-E-M-O-R-I-V-I-D-A dot com. 
Um, or if you look up my name on LinkedIn, you'll find me there. Brilliant. Well, I'll, I'll, all those things will be in the show notes as well. So people Great. can just click through, click through on that and, and go from there, I guess. Um, so is there anything that I should have asked you that hasn't come? Oh, I have got one more question. Because you, you said Seychelles, then you said Lake District and traveling around Scotland and everything. So where do you live now? I'm in Leeds, actually, in the north of England. Beautiful. Okay, yeah. good stuff. Yeah, it's lovely around here. Um, I mean, it doesn't matter where you live nowadays. <laughs> yeah. Everything virtually anyway. Yeah. Um, okay, Franco. So, yeah, back to that last question I just asked. Um, was there anything that I haven't asked that you would have liked to have shared whilst you were in this kind of interview? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Michael. Just a, a couple of small points is that is that firstly, you know, you mentioned um, just a few moments ago about people thinking, well, this is just a philosophical understanding. But actually, everybody knows this is true, because if you think back to that holiday experience um, mm. that I shared, everybody's experienced that. And that's how you know this is true. Um, yeah. or, or, for instance, when you've got really angry at someone and the more angry you are, the more right you think you are. And then yeah. you calm down and think, oh, why did I say that? Why did I send that email? So the truth of it is actually self-evident when you stop and think about it in, in, in every single interaction that we, um, we have in life. Um, and then the other thing as well is, is just, I think it's, it's easy for, for it to sound like that I'm saying to people that we should be happy all the time. And it's not like that at all. What I'm saying is yeah. when, you understand, when you understand how the thought and feeling process is created, you can be as angry as you like, but you just learn not to hang on to it. You learn to become childlike, like a three-year-old. I mean, look at three-year-olds. They're more angrier than you and I will be in the next five years, but a minute later, two minutes later, forgotten about. And as long as they're fed, happy, and not ill, what are they? Mostly happy and joyous. And we still, as weather-beaten adults, actually still have the same access to the, 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 the same resources that we were built with when we were three as well. So everybody just act like a three-year-old. <laughs> yes. Child, childlike, not childish is the caveat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, that's brilliant. So thank you for coming back to me on that. I think that's a really, really good point. Yeah, it is true. If you think my, that way, yeah. If you look at it that way, it's 100% true. Yeah, my pleasure. Franco, thanks for coming on the podcast. I really enjoy chatting with you. and. Uh, Maybe one day we'll see each other in person, but you never know when that might be. <laughs> Who knows, Michael? Well, thank you again for the invitation, Michael. Thank you to all the listeners um, for, for listening to me um, share my thoughts and share my story for however long it's been. It's always a pleasure to speak to you, and uh, I'm very grateful. Thanks, Franco. Cheers. Cheers. Take care. Bye. 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 If you've enjoyed this podcast, please rate, subscribe, and share at will. I'm always looking for more listeners and guests, so do get in touch, please. You can find me pretty easily by searching for Staying Alive UK. Thank you. Staying Alive UK. Share your story.